Good morning and welcome to the Bernkopf Goodman webinar, The Future of Urban Neighborhoods in a COVID-19 World. We will have a question and answer session after the presentation. Please use the Q&A section to submit your questions and our speakers will answer as many of those questions as possible. Quick reminder, the purpose of this presentation is for information only. Communication with any member of Bernkopf Goodman LLP in this forum does not establish an attorney-client relationship. Confidential or time-sensitive information should not be discussed on this forum. Hosting today, we have Bernkoff Goodman real estate and business law partner, Eric Allen. Eric has been recognized as a thought leader in real estate, has written extensively, and has been a speaker and a moderator on numerous panels, including being a TED's talk style speaker at the Cornet Global Summit at the Heinz Auditorium. Eric was recognized earlier this year as a top influencer by the commercial real estate publication, Globe Street. Joining Eric is Jesse Bearcon, founder of the real estate strategy firm, Graffito SP. Jesse and his team at Graffito have been working hands-on with restaurateurs, retailers, artists, makers, and other creatives for two decades. He is an outspoken advocate for real estate development strategies that embrace localism and experimentation. Jesse has been called a city maker by one publication for his company's work, which focuses on ground floor activation of mixed use projects. Most notably, he was one of the visionaries behind the revitalization of the Kendall Square area and currently works in neighborhoods throughout greater Boston. Jesse was kind enough to join us as our first guest on the Bernkoff Goodman podcast, Breaking Ground. On the podcast, Jesse discussed the importance of creating urban neighborhoods, neighborhoods where people live and work. Six months later, the world is a very different place. Eric, why don't we start with you? Thank you very much, Jeanette, and thank you all for attending. Uh, Jesse, uh, appreciate you taking time out of your busy life to join us today. Um, I want to be totally transparent at the beginning and mention to you uh, an unknown connection between Jesse and me. Um, Jesse's last name is Bear Cant, and Jesse joined two family names together. Well, my mother's maiden name is Bear, and my wife's mother name is Khan. Now, I believe Jesse joined the two names together, so he'd be the only Bear Can around. But just to be clear, uh, there are four of us now. It was, you know, um, my wife. <laughs> and also to clarify, half of that is from your wife's side. So I just want to make sure people understand. <laughs> I still think you're my cousin somewhere. Um, I'm cool with that. <laughs> so with that being said, Jesse, um, I wanted you to start out and tell us a little bit about uh, graffito and include um, what the SP stands for. So what's graffito SP all about? Yeah. Um, so I think Jeanette did a great job summarizing, although I think a lot of those are um, from our website, but the SP is strategic partners. And I think the aspiration of this company has, and will continue to be, how do we act as an informed, competent, uh, effective strategic partner to actors in um, the retail real estate space. And, you know, the reality is that our collaborators, our partners and our clients, um, a small handful of them are tenants, small handful are universities, but the majority of them are real estate investors and developers. Um, and they're doing it at scale. They're doing it neighborhood scale, they're mixed use assets. So where we fit in is really trying to figure out how the built form um, of their developments intersects with the public realm and that touches on uh, a slew of different disciplines and things but certainly one of the major tools we use to activate those neighborhoods is, is retail um, which you and I have spoke at, at length about in the past. That's true and uh, you know what's what's interesting Jesse if we look at the updates that Jesse's written and he started writing them in March um, the uh, first what's interesting about it is uh, recently I had a I, was, I attended a pitch day, I'm a mentor to the Harvard Business School entrepreneurship class. And Tim Draper was a speaker that day, the billionaire investor. And he said, uh, the companies that most interest him are those that don't fit into a particular category. And that's true of, of Graffito SP, uh, gra true of every member of your team. And um, when you look at your updates, they've been read and followed by everybody, both in the real estate industry and otherwise, because they, they're a must read. Um, but your most recent one, Jesse, the update number 12 that was last week, took a different turn than your other ones. And um, it basically was, we can do better. 
and it had to do with the response, your response, Graffito's personal response to George Floyd's death. Uh, could you uh, speak a little bit about that, Jesse, please? Yeah, uh, happy to. And, and, you know, this is something we're talking more about as a team um, than anything right now and over the past two weeks. And I think there is a feeling that um, we should have been talking about this well before the murder of George Floyd. Um, you know, we work in neighborhoods. We have the ability to impact change. We have the ability to, to use your words, do better and do a lot more. Um, and I think for us, what that means is revisiting our entire business, revisiting the way in which we write contracts to frame the conversation we'll have in our scope of work with clients, um, to touch on issues of equity and social justice um, and anti-racism. Um, and I think that part of us doing better is having more open and honest conversations about our, um, history as a business community, um, as a political community of um, building neighborhoods in a way where the foundation of that, not all of it, but much of it was racist. Um, and we know that that's not an opinion. Um, and we just have to do a better job changing that and um, reorienting ourselves towards those realities and towards um, doing more meaningful, better, and kind of equitable and just work. So, you know, we're, it's funny, we're talking about this so much as a team that, you know, we, we had a thought that is there burnout and, and ultimately what I realized, and I've talked to a bunch of folks about this is that, you know, even talking about this as something that you, um, that there's burnout is just such a statement of white privilege, um, that we can kind of say that our confronting of these, um, issues is something that, that would burn us out. Uh, so we're really leaning into it. We, we feel like we have to, we feel like our clients need us to, we feel like the cities we work in need us to. And, um, you know, it's been inspiring recognizing just based on conversations the last few weeks that, that we're not going to be alone in this. Um, and, and, and I think none of us are alone, Jesse, in this. I mean, when you look at um, the economic impact, it's much harder on the the black community, when you look at the health impact, it's been much more dramatic on the black community. When you look at everything and when you look at the history of it and uh, when you see what redlining does, when you look at new community, entirely new neighborhood of Seaport is almost completely white. So I think that we all have a lot of self-examination to do. Um, so thank Thanks you. So. <laughs> It is important, and it's important to be part of our daily lives to think about it. Um, Jesse, when when we did the podcast to you, which came out in uh, November of 2019, um, what did the world look like to you then? What, how did you perceive it when we talked about it during that podcast? Well, it was different. Um, you know, bridging our last conversation, there was, you know, it, it was equally as unjust, but um, putting that aside for a moment, um, whether that's the right thing to do or not, I'm going to. Um, you know, last fall we spoke, uh, and I was speaking with Jeanette on the podcast, you know, we were hyper-focused in touting our projects and our work um, and our effort to activate these places, which was really about bringing as many people as possible um, to, to restaurants, to beer gardens, to shops, to green spaces. Um, and, you know, there was, um, when you think about that pursuit, right, of place activation and bringing people together, uh, the conversations we've had over the last four months, you know, it's, it's the complete antithesis of that. It's how to keep people safe and spatially distant um, with, with some thought to what happens when we can safely and, um, confidently get back together. But, you know, our conversation, the podcast was about uh, creating these dynamic or diverse urban places um, with the compression of human beings and the underlying feeling that I, that I think came up on the podcast, which is that you create real estate value by creating demand from people to want to be in a place, a physical place, whether that's an office or that's a restaurant or that's retail or that's a green space. Uh, and to think about that now today, um, we're, we're in a really different place at this moment. Now, Jesse, I, I have a question. There were tendencies you saw happening then or trends or concerns. I mean, um, restaurants, 
specifically. Yeah. We, we talked about that, and I'd like you to share some of that, and also retail. What were the challenges you were seeing then um, that um, were now exacerbated, let's say, by COVID-19? But what were you seeing even before? Yeah, so even pre-2020, uh, I mean, there was intense pressure on retail and restaurants, um, and, and much of that was driven by cost of labor. Um, and, you know, I think part of that was compounded in the Boston area because of cost of housing. Um, and it was all about staffing. And, you know, there are two other issues there, I would say, um, you know, in the restaurant community, it was certainly about competition. Uh, and then generally, it was this kind of very challenging um, combination of a lot of retail square footage that came to the market over the last five years and even more coming because all of our mixed use projects have to have retail on the ground floor, right? I mean, cities are pushing for it. Developers are pushing for it. Tenants are pushing for it, you know, in the office, the lab, the resi side. So you've got all this um, new competition. And then, you know, there was a, at the time in 2019, we spoke a lot about this. Um, there was still a disconnect between revenue and rent. And if you understand rent as a product of revenue, um, you know, we were in a market where um, rents were overheated when you look at sales of retailers and restaurants, not all, but many of them. So we were already in a tough place um, and there were all sorts of pressures um, that were mounting from e-commerce. They weren't quite there yet in the way they are today for sure. But um, there was a lot out there that was not super pretty for brick and mortar retailers. And then, you know, coronavirus hit. But I would also say, you know, there was um, a struggle going on amongst uh, those developing new spaces or having existing spaces that is the first floor an amenity or is the first floor, um, you know, to make money off of. And, and some of the people you've worked with, I would say many have come to the persuasion that it is an amenity, uh, you know, along the lines that if we make the community be vibrant, fit into the fabric of the community, get people to come. It's going to increase the value of our building, um, attract tenants, uh, and the tenants will be, be able to attract employees. And therefore, there's a connection there. And if I can lower the rent some, then I can attract different types of tenants who can afford to be there. Totally. Yeah. And so, so then, you know, your update, your first update, Jesse, was March 13th. When did you start seeing something dramatically change and happen that was kind of a, a real threat to the neighborhoods that you had started to create? Well, there, there were two warning signs for us um, that predated mid-March. One was based on the fact, you know, our office in the Leather District, um, for those of you who know Boston, Leather District is right kind of sandwiched in between Chinatown, the Financial District, and South Station. Um, and to say we're regulars at Chinatown for lunch is an understatement, but, um, you know, as many of us know in Boston, you know, late January into February, um, Chinatown was struggling uh, for a slew of different reasons. Um, many of them had to do with people's, um, you know, unfair and um, bizarre connection between what was happening in China and the safety about eating in restaurants in, in Chinatown and, you know, we, our Monday lunches, I think for most of February, we were ordering in or going to restaurants in Chinatown to support them. So we saw what was happening in Chinatown and I think it more acutely made this real to us as a team. Uh, and the other is, you know, our work has been for over 10 years and continues to be, um, I wouldn't say centered, but a lot of our work is in East Cambridge, in Kendall Square. And, you know, the multinational companies, life science, tech, pharma, um, they were ahead of the curve in understanding what was going on. I mean, you think about Biogen, which we all know the story about um, that kind of super spreading event. Um, but I think universities and um, kind of creative economy and you know, folks in the medical sciences saw this coming first. And because many of those folks are our clients, we were, we were able to see it. Um, but then the acceleration through the first couple weeks of March and then, you know, when I sent out that first update, it was either March 12th or 13th. It was like, it was on us and it was moving at a rapid pace. And I think caught many of us in the real estate community completely, completely off guard and flat footed uh, by the scale of this, um, in particular the scale of the impact to um, retail real estate. 
Yeah, and what, what you were seeing there in your first seven updates was uh, an eyewitness account of the destruction of many of the um, uh, those local restaurants that didn't have uh, much in the way of reserves, and many of them won't come back, unfortunately, and retail operators, and that the PPP money, again, going back to the first part, PPP money did not go to many of those local small businesses, and certainly not in time on the first first part of it, and uh, and the access to resources to help it happen weren't there, and banks were favoring certain of their favorite customers. So the idea that minority communities were adversely affected, their businesses was very significant there. And by the time the second round came around, some of them weren't standing to be able to get there, had already let go of employees, and the changes in the rules on the PPP had a real impact. But um, I wanted to, to get your, your per perception of a couple of things that you see now. That is, what was accelerated, Jesse, by COVID-19 that you had alluded to? What was stopped in its tracks? And what are the budding of new things we see right now? And then we'll move to the future in a bit, but I'm curious as to your snapshot of those three issues. Um, so in terms of acceleration, and this is something I've written a lot about, uh, and the evidence is uh, powerful. Um, you know, when you look at e-commerce, and I think anecdotally, we all have examples of a, a parent or a grandparent or a family member or friend who was resistant to shopping online. And, and I'm, I'm pretty certain many of those folks um, have shopped online over the last three months. Um, but there, we essentially took what was supposed to be a slow burn of probably anywhere between, depending on what expert you spoke to, two or three or five or seven years of transition um, to e-commerce across uh, almost all sectors, right? Um, from a retail perspective, other than health and beauty, um, but even touching fitness, right? We're seeing that. I mean, people used to think fitness was, you gotta be in person to do it, but you see the changes there. You know, we took um, many years of um, coming change and basically compounded into three months. Um, that, that's what happened, and in really two months in the way that consumer spending and consumer behaviors pivoted. And it happened absolutely rapidly. Um, and it probably took something, it's hard to imagine there's something that could have accelerated that faster. Um, the other thing we're seeing is kind of the acceleration of failure from folks that just didn't have great business plans, weren't set up for flexibility. Um, and you know, I think this idea of acceleration of failure, we're gonna learn really quickly who the great companies are and the great uh, entrepreneurs are because of their ability to kind of change. Um, and, you know, this, this has touched everyone. I think that to your point, you know, if, if you don't have banking relationships, it was really hard even to get PPP in the first round and that disproportionately impacted female minority owned businesses. Um, so there's so much nuance to these issues, but, but, you know, the, the acceleration um, I feel like that's a word that everyone's talking about right now, but, but those are certainly two areas. Um, what was your second question? What was stopped in its tracks, Jesse? What, what, what was basically something that looked like it was going to be a winner? I would just say experiential, for example, and uh, the beer gardens. Um, but what was stopped in its tracks? And if yeah, you can yeah. think about it. a great example. Also something we wrote about. I mean, that was happening. It had been happening. Um, you know, any physical space. So, so here's what makes this kind of um, even more complicated is in the urban context, I think many of the folks probably on this call recognize that um, as these big boxes were getting harder and harder to fill from traditional retail who didn't need as much space, entertainment was kind of where folks turned, landlords turned to kind of fill some of these big boxes, especially in well-located areas, whether it was a food hall or a tap room um, or you know a place where you could, um, you know, bowl or, you know, kind of uh, video games, kind of new age video games like Barcade or A4K as a concept. Um, that's where folks were turning uh, aggressively. And that has been stopped in its tracks. Um, and some of that will come back, uh, but some of these companies are just not going to make it. So, you know, the opportunity to backfill these urban spaces with uses like this, that, that is gonzo. Um, and I think the other part of it is the nuance of understanding just how deep this is. 
you know, many of the folks in the craft beer industry, you brought up beer gardens who were kind of our usual suspects to talk to, to activate a place or to be a partner in a program or even to lease a space. If you don't have a canning operation, it's game over. So just like you said, with restaurateurs within the craft beer industry, we're going to see a lot of folks not make it because they don't actually have the system set up to serve today's demand. Um, and today, you know, no one's drinking draft beer. There's no demand currently for kegs. So if you can't produce canned beer, you're in trouble. But if you can, you're doing okay based on your wholesale and retail business. Um, so that's part of what we're trying to figure out at Graffito. It's, it's just, it's a lot harder than, and a lot more complicated than, you know, what tenants are active in the market right now, who's growing. It's really getting into understanding supply chain. Um, it's really getting into understanding the way in which retailers and restaurants get their goods. Um, but yeah, you know, where you started, the, it's, it's entertainment um, for sure has been stopped in this track. And, and I think in tracks, and I think for reasons some of us don't quite realize yet. And, and Jesse, a, a specific question. Um, you know, a lot of the spaces you fill um, in various, before, I'm going to talk about back in November of 2019, you worked very hard to keep it local, to keep it non-chain, to keep it representative of the community, to keep it diverse. Um, you have various different types of restaurants or even uh, places for people to have coffee, not, not the national chains, but different local ones. And what you look for were one or two or three or four locations that they had that happened to be successful. And you traveled widely, even to Europe with your team, to see, see what was going on in different places to say, see if you could replicate certain fields or for a variety of other reasons. Um, is it still... Is it still too early for you to talk about, um, you know, what might be the restaurants that are going to be able to make it besides the one who have fi finances? I mean, you're, you're going to be socially distancing. How does the restaurant pull it off, Jesse? How does the retail place pull it off? Uh, it's not too early to talk about. It may be too early to try to guess winners and losers, um, but time is going to tell quickly on who the winners and losers are. Um, but, you know, the challenges to the restaurant community are intense um, and they're not, it's, we're not measuring it or looking at it in months or even quarters. I mean, this is, this is going to go well into 2021. Um, and, you know, that's something we're thinking a lot about with our landlord clients and in tenant conversations, which is the scale of this, the duration of this. And, you know, a, a simple example is that, you know, there are a lot of tenants right now that are doing everything they can to defer rent today because today is so hard, but they're deferring it to the fall. And I can assure you it's not going to get easier for restaurants in the fall. And I can assure you they can't handle the extra load of rent that's going to be put on them by deferring, you know, June and July or April and May. Um, so, you know, I would say to your earlier to kind of where you started, which is where I thought you were going on kind of local businesses, you know, we also have a lot of confidence in the great locals ability to kind of pivot. Um, we have a lot of confidence in the locals that have a, a closer connection and a less friction in their supply chain. Um, the folks that have the relationships with the farmers, right? Um, and, you know, that that is one area that we're seeing and we're pretty confident that, you know, the folks that can develop more compact, more streamlined, more manageable supply chains in F and B, but I think this touches soft goods as well, are gonna be able to get through this um, in a better position, not unscathed, but in a better position than others. And I think that bodes well for um, creating more, um, you know, more reliant local communities, meaning reliant on each other. Um, and I think that's something we're tracking and we're exciting about, but um, also not, not easy to understand right now. Yeah, and, and you mentioned supply chains. You wrote about Kroger and what happened to them with their supply chain and the Amazon uh, supply chain. You know, as big as they were successful, even though they got more customers, they lost market share. They lost significant market share because they uh, weren't able to meet the rush of demand that came so quickly to them. And uh, and yet, you know, we we have a whole new landscape for you, Jesse. How do you look now, how do we see the future? And I want to, before we go right there, I wanted to talk to you about, you know, the Boston community back in November of 2019, the Boston real estate community and the community as a whole was very excited because we had 
so many drivers of our economy. We had, you know, all our schools and colleges. We had, and that affects retail. We had all of our um, uh, uh, hospitals and that affected retail. And, and in specific ways, you know, we had a sizable number of foreign students coming. Encore moved here because of the sizable number of Chinese nationals who were at schools here in Chinatown as well. And yet, um, you know, you have, you have now a pandemic that has run across all these different sectors. If students don't come back in the fall, it's gonna affect our, our student housing market and if it's gonna affect Newberry Street and Boylston Street and the Seaport Retail and other markets where those students and their families shop. I don't think it's an if, Eric. I mean, everything that we're reading and hearing is that some students may come back, but there's yeah. no doubt that the number uh, folks who are um, enrolling and physically coming to campus is going to go down. So it's not going to go down because because you have to social distance and colleges are being social in part. So so Jesse now and so uh, it's a domino effect in in part. It's the interconnectedness and so we have a slower recovery. And when they call talk about reopening. It's we're not putting Humpty Dumpty back together again. It won't happen. So as you look at Graffito and as you look at what's coming, your vision of the future, I'd like to know. And, I, and the first part is the general vision. And secondly, you're pivoting pretty quickly to new business and new opportunities. And I'd love for you to share some of those with us as you see, because you're changing as well, which is one of the most interesting aspects of Graffito. You move as quickly as the environment around you moves. So first, how do you see um, reopening? And then what do you see in the future? You've touched on a few of those, which um, already the idea of local. But what else do you see, Jesse? And what do you see as your new business? Yeah, um, a lot there. So You know, I think relative to the supply chain conversation, like we're just realizing we have to be um, a lot smarter uh, and do a lot more learning. And, you know, this is a great time to rebuild. I mean, talk about fixing back to our first and most important conversation. Talk about rebuilding in a much more informed um, and socially just way and creating something better. I mean, the, the retail market is not entirely broken, but pretty well broken. So it's a great time to kind of think about what the rebuild looks like. And in some ways, I feel fortunate that there's been this enlightenment around diversity, equity, and inclusion that we want to be part of that's going to allow us to rebuild more effectively. Um, and, you know, that's going to be part of Graffito's kind of rebirth here. But, you know, the other thing we're thinking a lot about is um, there are all sorts of tensions in cities that this has made us and forced us to think a lot about. Um, you know, you think about the way in which restaurants have had to pivot to takeout, something they never did, but we haven't built restaurants or storefronts or sidewalks or loading zones in the urban context for any of that, right? So how do we then think about queuing people six feet apart and cars pulling up um, and loading? You know, we have to really rethink the way in which we use physical space on the ground floor, which is always where pre-COVID, during, post, it's always where you have the most human interaction. And as those human interactions become a little bit more stressed because of what we're going through, you know, we're trying to figure out a way that we think in a much more holistic, um, holistic way about urban design and things like environmental graphics. And we're thinking also a lot in kind of some of the new businesses that we're pushing forward. We're thinking a lot about trust. Um, how do we work with landowners to make sure that, you know, people when they return feel comfortable, feel like they can trust a place, right? Um, and I think that transcends to how can they trust uh, a landowner that they're doing the right thing from a DEI perspective. So um, specifically, I, I think the, the two areas that we're really hyper-focused on are kind of growing a creative agency business, recognizing that messaging and storytelling um, in a very swift way and fast way is hypercritical and also creating the visuals to help people understand retail and public place is, is hypercritical. Could, uh, could you um, dig down a little bit into what you mean by environmental graphics? And, and uh, it's an area I'd like to, we, we spoke about it recently, but I think I'd like to have you speak in your own words about it. 
Sure, I'll do my best. Um, I mean, the most common um, the most common example is just simple wayfinding and signage in the public realm. You know, telling us and helping us understand how to get from one place to another. Um, but right now, we have to understand all these new ways of being consumers and doing business. How do we understand where to stand to pick up um, the sneakers we just bought online that we want to go pick up at a local shop? Uh, you know, how do we understand and um, figure out what door to go through when we go and pick up food for our family. So we're going to have to have all of these visual tools that um, help people organize in our new reality. And we're going to have to also have all these visual tools that assist um, the pursuit to reinforce that we're going to be building safe places. Um, we're going to be powerful stewards for these places where you can trust that we've thought about a lot of these things. And, you know, how do we do this in an inclusive way? You know, um, Brooke wrote really powerfully on our blog a few weeks ago about inclusivity and graphic design. And, you know, we had a client who called us out on this brilliantly that we had created um, a floor um, stencil that showed where people were to stand for going to a, a restaurant project they were about to kick off. And it was a picture of feet but everyone coming to that restaurant isn't necessarily walking, right? Like it was just, we didn't recognize that there are people showing up in wheelchairs and there are all sorts of people that actually um, need to consume this visual content. And we've got to do it in a way that makes people feel a lot more comfortable. So, you know, it's a very long winded explanation of the way in which we're thinking about environmental graphics, but um, it is, it is really, really needed as people return to work. Um, and I would also say we've been to a, a fair, a fair, amount of office buildings and you know you walk into some of these lobbies and the first thing I feel is scared not taken care of not safe so you know our clients are going to have to figure out lobbies they're going to have to figure out their own storefronts they're going to have to figure out messaging and it's going to be a riddle that we have to solve for quite some time and I think the landlords and the developers um, that that do a good job with this um, and can facilitate trust are, are going to be really well positioned for uh, our recovery. And I, I think another player in this all is, um, you know, local, state, and federal governments in being able to listen uh, to what's going on because, you know, a variety of, of restaurants uh, players that I know aren't opening. They just aren't opening because they can't make enough money through takeout, particularly with Grubhub and, and uh, DoorDash and Uber Eats taking, you know, 25, 40% out of every meal and, and you only have 25% in the restaurant. They got to give them the sidewalk. They got to get a piece of sidewalk. And I think cities and towns and municipalities that move quickly to assist and listen to the needs of retail, particularly when it's in such stress, need to figure out how to modify their regulations, streamline their process, and, and help developers and their, their retailers get better. I mean, if you look at space uh, in uh, office buildings being 25% occupied, what's it gonna do to retail and nearby? What's it gonna do to restaurants nearby if they don't have their usual lunch crowds? Not only limited to 25%, for some time to come, we don't know. A crisis is not knowing the outcome and we don't know it right now. So, um, uh, what's your thoughts along those lines? That, well, do you think that from your interactions, and I know how much you guys do interact with local governments with your with your the companies you work with. Um, do you think they'll be responsive and move it quickly enough to uh, kind of assist in this this rebuilding? Yeah, and they already are. I mean, I think municipalities um, are doing their best. Um, with, as we know, uh, within a structure that is not set up for being moving with pace or being entrepreneurial, but we have seen cities move with pace. I, I think the one concern we have, um, you know, we're working on a project in Kendall Square that involves the cooperation of the city landowners, retailers, and a technology partner, recognizing that, you know, yeah, you can take back some parking spaces and create pickup and loading zones, and you can allow restaurateurs to spill out on the sidewalk. Um, but then how do you deal with public transit and bus lanes and bike lanes and pedestrians that are queuing for their order at a restaurant that also just took over a sidewalk? And I think part of this really does involve technology. And that's one of the other areas that we're thinking a lot about is how do we use data to help inform some of the decisions that we're making with our real estate? 
simple example is, um, you know, if everyone shows up at lunch at 12 o'clock in Kendall Square, right, to pick up, if, if corporations even, quote, allow employees to leave, it's going to be a disaster. So how do we use technology and ordering to kind of throttle that ordering, to kind of pace that ordering so that there can be harmony between the folks that are sitting outside in the sidewalk and the folks that are lining up on the sidewalk and the delivery cars that are coming up. So I think it can't just be done by cities. Um, this is going to have to be a really collaborative neighborhood scale initiative. And, I, and I'm very, very heartened by the reality that um, a lot of the civic organizations, you know, um, business organizations and municipalities are starting to realize that some of this is actually best done on a neighborhood scale, which is where we're interested, as opposed to doing it one off because cities just can't handle one off requests. Um, and vibrant urban neighborhoods can't actually accommodate every retailer's requests. So it's, again, it's a super complicated issue, but we're trying to figure it out. Um, and the best way we can do that is through experimentation. Um, so we're about to launch a few pilots within the Boston area to kind of look at some of these things, uh, which we're super excited about. So, so Jesse, um, can you, are there other areas that Graffito SP is going into? And I want to come back to what is, SP mean now? What did it mean and how has it expanded in your, in your, your thoughts? So SP. Yeah. Um, you got me with this one. You know, it's funny that I really wanted graffito. I'll spare you the history of the name of graffito, but I needed there to be three letters. I felt it was really important as you can tell from a branding perspective. Um, and the GSP made sense for a bunch of reasons. And when I launched the company, you know, 10 years ago or so, um, it was special projects, but I always had in my mind that, you know, strategic partners, but we weren't at a place at a small company that we felt like um, we were ready to be the kind of strategic partner that I knew we could be. And I think we're there now. Um, and, you know, one of the things and one of the other pivots we're making is how do we work with our clients, our collaborators, some of our existing partners to, um, to at times invest in projects um, to uh, of some of which we've done outside of this market um, and to at times be really flexible about the way in which we're structuring our engagement, recognizing that um, there's, there's going to be increasing pressure despite the stock market um, on the economics of many of our clients. And we're going to have to be super entrepreneurial um, and we are going to have to operate more as a strategic partner. Um, and that, that, you know, for us is, um, is a really multidisciplinary kind of pursuit. Um, and I don't have all the answers here. You know, we're, we're having a lot of conversation about what this means. Um, but, you know, we like our logo. So we, we got to keep the SP. We got to own it. Uh, but we'll still talk about ourselves as just graffito. Uh, you, you know, what's interesting, it's uh, now 940, and uh, we do want to leave time for questions. But I think what's interesting, we've done a series of these podcasts, one with Bill Porvoo doesn't have all the answers. You can recognize the problems. What's important is to have a different perspective on it. We had SGA and architecture talking about the office, and now we have you talking about um, retail. And the, the theme is you got to keep thinking and you got to keep changing and you got to be listening all the time to what your clients' needs are. In your area, you're being asked to fix it and uh, fix that first floor, fix the placemaking, fix the neighborhood. And it won't be fixed by using glue and putting it back together, as we mentioned. It's going to be something new. And um, the future is challenging. I think local is one of the things you spoke about, Jesse, and that we're going to you know, really take a look at uh, the supply chains. And um, you know, if we can't keep the long ones there, we have to have redundancy on the local ones, and maybe the local ones take supremacy. Um, I also think that the idea of the, using technology in a way that's going to help people and solve these problems, you, you got to involve it. Um, prop tech is taking much more significance and has been accelerated. Um, Jesse, thank you so much for uh, this part of the conversation. I wanted to continue in the question and answer, and you've taken us on a time journey with you in a variety of ways, and I think we could talk for much longer, but I want to leave it open for questions. So. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you for the attendees and thank you for your questions that came. Let's see what they are. Jeanette, why don't you take over from here? Okay, we have a couple questions already, but just a, a reminder, if you have a question, use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen to ask them. 
First question, pre a vaccine for COVID-19, how do restaurant how do restaurant owners or retailers get lines of credit or other loans for build outs or working capital? <laughs> that is a challenge. And uh, I would say, uh, you know, the whole idea of financing right now is, is questionable as to how do you underwrite an office building now? How do you underwrite, um, you know, any type of asset in real estate right now? Uh, industrial is pretty easy. Biolife science is pretty easy. You go into hospitality or retail. Um, it's a challenge. And I think that that's going to be uh, very tough to see where people get their finances. And it's going to be, um, go back to what Jesse said, I believe. And that is, uh, and you need to be able to to have an idea that's going to attract um, the attention of somebody that says they're going to take a chance with you. I do not know if it's going to be traditional finance. Jesse, your thoughts. Yeah. I mean, two points. One would be, um, you know, the challenge is that I think the question was about restaurants and retailers. The business model is already so stressed and the margins are, are tight and it's hard to make it work. And, you know, one of the challenges with traditional debt is that um, it adds more cost so, you know, what we're seeing with locals is that you're really going through um, uh, a private offering to raise money yeah. um, as opposed to going to traditional lending sources. And, you know, the, the dirty secret here is that folks who don't have the network of wealthy individuals and end up going to banks, many of them sign personal guarantees. Uh, banks require it. And again, that's one other area where our whole system is set up to disproportionately kind of disadvantage um, or just plain disadvantage minority and female owned operators that are starting. Um, and, you know, they may sign personal guarantees and leases and with banks because there's nothing else there. Um, so, you know, that's one way through personal guarantees, but if you didn't have any personal worth, you weren't going to get it. Um, and, and, you know, I also just would say the right now I do not see bank debt or any debt that requires um, a regular and immediate payback for restaurateurs to help. Um, because they can't burden the additional debt load, just the monthly expense of servicing um, that loan or, or you know, paying the principal and interest on that loan. So you know, I don't think moving forward debt is, a, is it gonna be a great solution as much as many of our clients are kind of pushing us to say like, hey, you know, can't, these guys, um, can't these guys go out and, and, and you know, interest rates are super low and get a loan? Um, it, it's hard, it's really, really hard for retailers, um, especially the local ones, which are the ones that we deal most with. I would say that also, um, Jesse, you were uh, on a panel with the CBA at one time, and I, I do know the one of the panelists who's in the restaurant business, um, uh, Jameson from Lolita, said, you know, there's an oversaturation even now, back then, that is, uh, in the restaurant business, and that, you know, a lot are going to fail. With or without the pandemic, he wasn't even thinking of the pandemic. Okay, it didn't so exist. That was like four years ago, right? That's right. He, and it's been so much more. He said everybody in there, everybody wanted to invest in restaurants and say, hey, this is my restaurant. Um, but I do think that it, it, there's going to be a pressure point also with landlords on looking at that issue of does it does do they want the bottom floor vacant or do they want to make concessions? And is it amenities that they perceive of as being retail and restaurant or a money maker? And there's, I believe that there are going to be leases moving to percentage rent, for example. And, um, you know, I think you're going to see a move there. Um, and either it's going to be, you know, you pay taxes and operating them percentage rent over, but somehow there's got to be a give if you want to keep your first floor vibrant. Um, your thoughts on that, Jesse? Yeah, I agree. No. Uh, Jeanette, next question. Next question is from Abby. She writes, you spoke about building trust in the space. There also needs to be trust in the staff. Any ideas about how this can develop? For example, believing a waiter is not contagious. You know, I think this goes to where we, uh, one of the last bits of the conversation with Eric, which is um, part of building trust is really effectively communicating. And, you know, we're having a lot of conversations with restaurateurs right now about how they communicate at the moment of entry into a restaurant when you're experiencing and in a restaurant, and oh, by the way, way before you got there, through email communications and through website. Um, so, you know, I, I think Abby nailed it. It's about an education. Um, 
But I think along with that education is action and really previewing to folks what you were doing in the restaurant with your staff to keep them safe, keep staff safe and keep customers safe. And I think that touches on just the need for really clear and effective communications right now. Um, because without that, I do not see consumers coming back. And there's a lot of confusion. There's just a lot of confusion with consumers um, who are, you know, willing to spend money, but are, are nervous. Um, so, you know, that's my best answer. Uh, and, and I know there are a lot of people thinking about this. We haven't seen um, a ton of really great examples of this yet, but um, they're coming. Uh, and, you know, there are also some really bad examples. Um, you know, and I can just tell you from talking to folks within the hospitality, food and beverage industry across the country, you know, there are a lot of restaurateurs that are, the demand is there. They're not following a 40% or 50% occupancy um, restriction because they're desperate. People are there. People want to spend money. People want to come out. Um, and what that's doing actually is in the moment, people are having a great time and spending money. Um, but that's really kind of decaying and breaking down the trust that that restaurant could have with the public to do this thing right. So we're watching this. We are really concerned about it. I think it's a great question. I, I would simply add to it that um, uh, it has to do how, how transparent you are to both your employees and to your customers, um, including, by the way, staff for office workers. Many people are fearful. How are they going to get into the elevator? How are they going to go to the bathroom? You know, how dangerous are things in which I, I meet? You know, they're thinking of having everything being automatic. You wave your hand or you step on a foot pedal to open up doors. But I think that how transparent you are in the retail and restaurant industry, this is what we're doing with our staff and having that message out there and having your staff feel comfortable enough to come back you know, with the safeguards you're taking for them. There was an incident that happened in the country uh, very recently where I, a salon worker I worked sick, was sick, and they tested everybody, and zero people came back sick because they had taken all the precautions. Everybody was wearing masks and gloves, and none of the customers got sick. So I think that it's, it's how many precautions you take, how, you, how transparent you are to your employees. But um, Abby's right on the money. Abby is in the insurance business, and I think we didn't even touch on that, but it is an area that's of great concern for all of us. Will there be changes in the insurance industry that will help us uh, for the next pandemic, for the next time we have something? Because right now, business interruption has a hole in it, and it's for a pandemic. And unless Congress backstops that, we won't be seeing likely successful suits against insurance companies to make them pay for business interruption, either the landlords or tenants. Um, Jeanette, next question. Many landlords need lender approval for rent concessions to a tenant. Are any of the landlords you work with finding lenders resistant to approving such concessions? Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, I think that, and, and Eric has some experience in this, so I'm actually curious to hear what his answer is, but um, the, the issue of lenders We've seen some lenders behave um, beautifully. When I say beautifully, kind of really move very rapidly to understand the issues here and understand the connection between revenue and rent. And when there's no revenue, the expectation of rent, um, for them, they got it. Uh, you know, the, the, I think part of the issue is that without exception, every lender that we've spoke to and we've been privy to conversations with between our clients and those lenders, you know, comes up the issue I spoke about earlier is duration and the scale of the help. And, you know, it's really different um, when you actually have to draft a lease amendment. Um, and, you know, I think that there's a lot of education required because the majority of lenders in this space, the majority of lenders um, and capital partners that have invested in retail over the last 10 years, I don't think I'd call them retail experts. And they're certainly not experts in understanding the pressures on, on restaurants, entertainment venues, retail shops right now. So they do need to be educated. Um, and, you know, we're encouraging our clients and we're encouraging actually the retailers we speak to to like take that education beyond, um, you know, phase one and phase two opening. Because, you know, those second lease amendments 
Um, and when you can't pay rent in the fall, you know, those are going to be more, those are going to be also difficult conversations. So it's a, again, a very long winded way of saying, um, yes, we're seeing lender resistance, not uniform. Um, and we actually, I, I expect that many of the tenant requests that we're seeing from both nationals and locals that are asking for relief, some sort of relief through 2021, which I think is realistic given what we're up against, lenders are having a, they can't, they can't swallow that. They're not able to right now. We've seen very few lenders um, agree to sweeping long-term changes. And Eric's right in this previous statement, a lot of these deals are gonna move towards percentage rent deals, but we all know the way in which real estate is, um, is valued. And you know, unless you get really creative with percentage rent, you know, you're not gonna take a triple net lease at 50 bucks, convert you know, and sign a lease amendment that says no base rent, we're going to percentage rent. I mean, what that does for, for value is, is real. So um, this is one of those issues that's gonna keep coming up. Um, and we're gonna be dealing with, I believe Graffito will be dealing with this issue of lender approvals um, for at least the next year. At least. I, I would answer it this way, Jesse, that, um, you know, many lawyers, I, I wouldn't say that we're unique in this category, but many lawyers on the borrower's side, or, or at least um, those that I know of, are sophisticated enough to differentiate between major leases and minor leases. And with minor leases, um, pre-COVID-19, um, you would be able to uh, make changes in the ordinary course of business. Sometimes there were restrictions that you need to take a look at, such as fair market rent and this and that. But, you know, if you had negotiated those up front and you're talking about office buildings, those retail spaces, most of them can get by as being minor uh, leases that you can make concessions for. Now, the larger tenants, um, let's say CVS, which is actually doing well, but a CVS would be a major tenant that they may say, no, we want to have approval on it. And then many uh, people in the field that I know would also look to those pre-COVID-19 and try to have some parameters. Um, and uh, But I know major, major players who did not have those types of clauses. And uh, when the borrower came knocking, the lenders just said no. And they said no in April. And you and I both know that we saw April as bad. We saw May as being much worse. And although there's um, not been total catastrophe since then, certainly not in June, um, we aren't out of the woods yet. We, we b both believe that the fall is going to be challenging in many ways. So I do think it comes down to uh, really having the lenders understand that not only do they need to help the tenants, they need to help their borrowers and be reasonable. Um, and some of the moves that we're seeing going on is with uh, particularly more local banks that if they get their interest paid, they can defer principal sometimes if it's an interest in principal loan. Now, there's a variety of things that, particularly the local banks, it should be noted that in the last slowdown, the Great Recession, it was the local banks that came in with financing that helped many of the players out uh, when major banks did not. And I think that, again, it's an opportunity for local banks to come to the forefront. And that goes back to local. Uh, you know, there's many local cooperative or, or other banks that are regional that I think uh, could show flexibility in this, and hopefully the larger banks will as well. Yeah, and Eric, I, I would just add, um, you know, I think your point about um, the majority of retail in this city, although an increasing amount of kind of institutional mixed use developers and landowners are owning a lot more retail, the majority of retail and, and the vast majority of retail investors um, historically and still today, you know, they may be one story buildings, three story buildings, especially in the urban context. So I think it, for those, for those borrowers and those lenders, um, this is gonna be really hard. Um, and yes. down, when you look, when you forecast a year or two or three out, we don't see a graffito at getting that much easier. Right? It will get a little bit easier. Um, but the question is when these tenants can't satisfy their lease obligations relative to their base rent, um, who's next in line to step up and pay that $50 triple net rent. Um, and there's going to have to be, there's going to be a lot of, um, revisiting, I believe, revisiting the value of retail real estate, which has been just absolutely, you know, super low cap rates, 
and banks have been okay with super aggressive um, underwriting that assumes a hypothetical tenant who's willing to pay probably more than is going to be the case right now or, or for any time in the foreseeable future. Yeah, and, and one other thing from a bird's eye view, um, wealthier neighborhoods in New York have already 40% have taken flight. Um, what does that mean over the long term? We don't know, but we do know that in places like Greenwich, there are, play, there are homes renting for 60000 a month. Um, and there's 16 people lined up to buy it sight unseen, or, or excuse me, rent it in that case. And the, the brokers in those areas, they don't have enough product. And prices have gone up in the suburbs around Boston. So what does that mean long term? You know, how long this carries on, uh, and it will, will carry on for a while. What does it mean about density, which is so critical to the operation of many of our urban uh, retail places, if it if it becomes less populated um, over time, uh, what does that mean? So, uh, next question to Jeanette. Um, we're we're all set with questions, and we're actually right just at time. just at time. So, I just wanted to thank Jesse again for joining us. This was incredibly helpful. If anybody has questions directed to Eric, you can reach him through our website www.bg hyphen llp.com. And if you'd like to hear the original podcast that we had with Jesse last November, you can go to that podcast website. It is bg hyphen podcast.com. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jesse. It's been a wonderful journey in time backwards. Hopefully the future has some promise for us. You've given us some ideas. Thanks again for joining us. Thanks for having me.